our loving and gracious Heavenly Father. Lord God, I, I thank you for this church and this body of believers and the, the fellowship we have and the fun, the, the, even the joking and the picking on that we can do on each other. But Lord, I thank you that we glorify you, that, that our goal is to honor you, that we want to see the lost come saved, that, that we want to grow, we want to mature, that we want to be the church. Lord, I know without a doubt you've called us right here to this particular community in, in this exact day and age for an exact purpose that you've laid out before us. So Lord, I just pray that we would be willing to step up and do that. That, that we, you've created us in your image just for this purpose. So I pray for this message, Lord, that, that you've laid upon my heart this week, that you wouldn't let my preparations interfere with your message to these people. I pray that you'd use me as, your, as a speaker, Lord. You'd take me completely out of the equation and just let the Holy Spirit move within us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as a Christian, you know we're, we're tried, we're tested, we're, we're proven, but we never fully arrive, we, we never completely achieve whatever it is, uh, whether it's a certain level or whatever it is, we never achieve that. We're, we're never completely where we want to be. You know where we want to be, right? We want to be perfect. And we never achieve perfection this side of heaven. We never uh, come to a place where improvement is no longer needed. It's like the advertising slogan. We can all, we're always new and improved. And tomorrow, I'm still new and improved. And next week, I'm new and approved. I, I can attest even as a pastor, I haven't arrived. I still endure trials. I'm still tempted. I'm still tested. God continually tests me. He, he grows me. He pinches me. forces me to move forward, to become more than I am now. That happens every day, every week. At times, God turns the heat up. At times, He turns the pressure up. You ever, you know what it feels like when God turns the heat up on you? When He turns the pressure up on you and you find yourself in a situation or something's happening and you, you just wallow in it. You just love it, right? <laughs> it hurts. It's painful. Sometimes it's embarrassing. But on the other side of it, you've grown. You've made another step. You've reached another level, so to speak. Sometimes God kind of lays off. Sometimes the pressure comes down. Sometimes life is good. We like that, right? How many levels do we achieve? How fast do we grow when there is no pressure? We get pretty satisfied right where we are. It don't hurt. You want to keep it that way, right? Our trials, our testing, our temptations, they are not accidents. They are appointments made by God. They're opportunities for us to become better in some way, more than we are right now. We're, we are accountable for how we respond to these kind of pressures from God, these testings, these trials, these temptations. We're accountable. We can either become better, we can make that next level, we can be more like Christ, or we can fail. We can fail. We can respond sinfully. We can fall farther from God. Just because we're Christians, just because we're church folks, we're church folks, right? Go to church, most of you are here every Sunday. Just because of that doesn't guarantee you're going to respond the way you should. Paul knew this. In fact, this was his concern for writing the letter. Last week, I looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the first five verses. The first five verses, that's what I looked at last week. I'd like to reread them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. What was it that Paul couldn't endure any longer? He said, when I could endure it no longer, what, what was it that he couldn't endure? 
He wanted to know how they were doing. Are they holding fast to their faith? Are they being steadfast? That's what he wanted to know. So he did something about it. He sent Timothy. And if you remember last Sunday, I told you, Timothy brings back a report on how the church was doing. And you had to wait until this Sunday to find out that report. And Paul was ecstatic. Paul was very happy. So my first point was for Paul, when he was taking care of that church there, the first thing he sent was a helper. He sent them a helper. He sent them Timothy. We just saw that in the first five verses. The next verse, chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writes, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long, long to see you. So Timothy came back to Paul and told him, it says, told that the new believers there, that they were standing firm in their faith despite the persecution they were suffering. Now, when I say persecution, you know what I mean, right? People were, picky. People were picking on them, right? Yeah, these, these people were dying for their faith. And they were still holding fast. They were still, they were, they, they were, well, it says, brought us the good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us. Um, he, another thing I noticed in here is that the people didn't believe the lies that they were being spread about Paul. Remember they were spreading lies that Paul was just in it for the money? You know, that he was trying to get people to follow him to make himself look good and to get rich. Right? And nobody uses religion today to make money, right? <laughs> so they were accusing Paul of that. That's all he was doing was trying to make money. And they didn't believe that. Now, Timothy, Paul sends Timothy to the church. Timothy comes back to Paul and gives this report. This report is, isn't written. We don't have a written record. Paul, you know, Timothy didn't fill out a, you know, a formal report and file it with Paul. It was a conversation they had. Timothy came back and talked to Paul. We don't have a, a written record of exactly what we, was said, but we do know what Paul's concern was for the church, right? A couple Sundays back, Paul was a faithful steward of the church, a loving mother to the church, and a concerned father for the church. And those first five verses of chapter 3 that I just read, he was really concerned about their faith, if they were holding fast. So I know what Paul's concern was. What Timothy brought back, he uses the word, was good news. That's a real interesting way to put it. Some translations translate the real word that Paul used as glad tidings. Does your translation use glad tidings? Or does it say good news? That word that's written there in the Greek is euangelion. Perhaps you've heard me use that word before. That's the word we get the word gospel from. And a literal translation of euangelion is good news. That was the word Paul wrote, that Timothy brought back good news. Does good news sound familiar to you? You know what we call the first four books of the Bible? The New Testament, the Gospel, the Good News. So what does Timothy bring back to Paul? The Euangelion, the Gospel, the Good News. Now this isn't the Gospel that saves us. That's not the Gospel that saves your soul. The Good News that Timothy brings back is the Gospel that the people in Thessalonica were saved souls. To Paul, this was like hearing the Gospel. That made him happy. That made him joyful. Paul's response to that good news was to write them this letter, this letter that he sent them. Now, you've got to know the Apostle Paul. He was a prolific writer. He wrote dozens and dozens of letters. I mean, probably hundreds more likely. And we have many of the letters he wrote. He wrote to churches. We have them in the New Testament. He wrote Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. These two letters to the church at Thessalonica that we're looking at right now. He also wrote letters to people, the individuals. And we have them in the Bible as well. You know, he wrote to Titus. You ever heard of Titus? Philemon. You heard of Philemon? He also wrote letters to his young protege. Two letters that we have in our Bible, First and Second Timothy. So Paul wrote a lot. We don't have all of his writings. In fact, after 2,000 years, I'm quite sure that many of them have been lost and if it's been lost and we don't know about it, then we don't know about it, right? I, I would be interested. You could do a study on that. Um, I found some things on the Internet. I don't know how trustworthy they are. Like, as is with the Internet, you take everything with a grain of salt, right? But I found alleged other letters that Paul had written. There are some that are in the Apocrypha, the letters that weren't accepted into the Bible for one reason or another, and that's a whole, that's a whole message in itself. But 
Paul was a prolific writer. He wrote a lot. <clears throat> what we do have was because the church decided to save and to preserve those letters. These letters to churches, these letters to individuals. The church was inspired by God, I, I would say, to keep the ones they did when they decided, what are we going to view as authority? What are we going to view as from God? This is pretty important, is it not? What is God's Word? And the church, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saved some of these letters. and They recognized that God inspired Paul to write this letter to Thessalonica, to write this letter to the church of Rome, to light, write this letter to his young man named Timothy. And they saved that, and this become what we call the New Testament. You know what this suggests to me? That the Word of God is probably the best tool for establishing the church and for founding your faith. How, what do you want your faith founded on? What do you want as a basis? What are you going to stand on? You want to stand on the U.S. Constitution? No. Do you, you, you want to stand on some self-imposed you know, code of ethics and morals? Or do you want to stand on what's called the Word of God, what we call the Word of God. I think that would probably make the best foundation for you. In fact, in Paul's, the next letter he writes to this church, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And we have a lot of those letters Paul wrote. And I think they're pretty good to stand firm on, do you not? The second thing Paul gave them was the Word. The Word with a capital W, the Word. The Word of God. Paul sends them Timothy and he gives them the Word of God. Verses 7, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if we stand firm in the Lord. You want to really live? You need to stand firm in the Lord. And how do you stand firm in the Lord without His Word? We have an issue as human beings. We're subjective. You know what I mean by subjective? Quite often we want to act on how we feel. Anybody act with their feelings? There's, oh, there's, well, well, according to how many people raise their hands, there's only six of us here that act according to our feelings. Did you know feelings can change? You know, when I was a kid, I hated vegetables. Anybody, any kids in here hate, well, there's no more kids in here. <laughs> I let them go. When you guys were kids, did you hate vegetables? Do you like them now? Maybe not all of them. There's still probably some vegetables you don't like, right? I don't, there's a few I don't like. But I eat them now. You know why? Because I've learned that they are good for me. That they contain things that my body requires to function properly. When I was a kid, I didn't care. But now that I'm a grown-up and I have things that aren't functioning the way they should, I want to eat better, right? The same applies to the Word of God. You want to live properly? You want to function properly? You need the Word. Remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan? Matthew chapter 4, the first half of that chapter. Every time Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus' answer was, it is written. That's what his answer was every time. Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in their battle against Satan. That goes in the armor of God part in Ephesians 6. The Bible is able to establish us because it's inspired by God. Another of Paul's letters that he wrote to Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, this is a verse that's worthy to be memorized if you like to memorize verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 state, all scriptures is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The Bible is not just simply a book of religious ideas. It's not a code of ethics, a code of morals. The Bible is the very word of God. This is from God's lips to your ears. That's what the Bible is. A working knowledge of the Bible is essential. You have to have it for spiritual growth. You have to have it for stability in your faith. 
If your faith isn't grounded on the Word of God, it's going to go whatever way the wind's blowing or whatever way political correctness is pushing it. Whatever way common opinion or cultural opinion is going to push you. Your faith needs to be balanced firmly on the Word of God and not on the pressures of this world. God's Word nourishes us, as we've seen in the last chapter, as a a nourishing babe. That's what the Word of God is for you. Did you know it will guide your path? Psalms 119 says it's a light unto your feet to show you your path. It's a weapon that you can use to fend off Satan. In fact, it's the only weapon God gives you, the sword of truth. If you go through the armor of God, you've got a whole lot of armor. You've got a lot of ways you can defend yourself against Satan. This is the only thing you can use to attack with. You can attack Satan with the Word of God. Did you know that? Has Satan ever tempted you? I would hope everybody feels that Satan has attacked you in some way or another, tempted you in some way or another. And I, as your pastor, let me give you a word of advice. Don't stand firm, go toe to toe, and raise your fist up and try to take him on. Take up your Bible, just like Jesus did, and use Scripture. That's the best tool you have. It's your only weapon you have. You can hide behind your shield and put on your helmet of salvation and Tighten up your greaves and you have your, you have your boots on and all that good stuff, but without that sword, you're just a punching bag. Who wants to be a punching bag for Satan? I didn't see a single hand go up. Who wants to pull out the sword of truth, God's Word, and fight back? How are you going to do it if you don't know it? Thessalonians, it's saturated with biblical doctrines. There's a lot in here. But according to this letter to Timothy, it says that it's good for doctrine. You know what doctrine is? Well, doctrine is basically what we believe. What do you believe? That's called doctrine. Doctrine tells us what's right. You want to know what's right? You want to know what's wrong? This is like a two-year-old thing here, actually. Kids want to know what's right and wrong. What can I do and what can't I do, right? Don't you want to know your boundaries? We need to know our boundaries, right? In other words, society turned into chaos. It would be anarchy if you didn't have boundaries. That's what doctrine is. It tells us what's right. Reproof tells us what's not right. Correction tells us how to get right. And instruction tells us how to stay right. That's what the Word of God is. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good roof, every good work, excuse me. And Thessalonians is full of it. In fact, all the major doctrines of the Christian faith, they're touched on in some way or they're downright blatant in the book of Thessalonians. It's all there. A working knowledge of the Bible is essential for that. Knowing this, I'd like to remind you of the Gospel of John, and in fact, I'd like you to turn there if you have your Bible with you this morning. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I want you to do more than just hear it with your ears. I want you to see it with your eyes as well. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, is talking about the Word. I love the way John starts this, because he started just like Moses started. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then the author, John, the apostle, goes on and writes about John the Baptist for a little bit. And then he gets to verse 14. And it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word. And He was in the beginning with God. This is the Word that you need to found your faith on, that you need to base your your lives on. And this is what Paul was giving them, was the Word. Paul sent Timothy to check on their faith, to make sure they're holding on. He He sends them this letter, which becomes the Word of God. And he ministered to them in a third way also. Verses 9 and 10. He prays for them. Verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all of the joy with which we rejoice before our God 
on your account. As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. The Word of God should, and prayer should go together like, like, what are two things that go together? Peanut butter and jelly, bread and butter, chocolate and peanut butter. I don't know, what are, what are two things that go together like you can't even separate sometimes? Maple syrup and pancakes? I'm going to say they need to go together like the prophet Samuel in prayer. Did you know Samuel wrote, Moreover, as for me, far be it for me, that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good way. The prophet Samuel said that. Peter, Peter says it too. Peter wrote, Acts chapter 6, verse 4, Peter wrote, but we, uh, the we was Peter and the other apostles, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Prayer and the Bible, prayer and the Word go together inseparably, like peanut butter and jelly, Dorothy said. They're perfect together. Jesus prayed for his disciples. Do you know that? In fact, <laughs> just like Paul was praying for the Thessalonian church, Jesus prayed for Simon. His, it was Peter, Petros, Simon. They're the same person. In Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. I'm not even sure what that means. What does that mean? If Satan wants to sift you like wheat, that can't be a good thing. So Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. That's Luke 22, verse 31. Paul prayed that he could return to them and to complete what was lacking in their faith. Now I had to scratch my head over this. And this should make you question too, what could possibly be lacking in their faith? They were dying for their faith. Of what possible lack could there be? Could you be more faithful than to be faithful to the point of death? Is it possible? But they were dying for their faith, so what possible lack could they have? To answer this, I have to go back to my introduction. We never arrive. We never achieve we never come to a place where we can no longer improve for God. It doesn't happen this side of the grave. It doesn't happen this side of heaven. You never finally, I'm there. I no longer have to grow. That doesn't happen. You should be growing continually. Paul kind of touches on this in Romans one seventeen. Paul writes, imagine Paul again, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Our faith never reaches perfection or completion. It is something that needs to grow. We grow from faith to faith. I think Abraham is an excellent illustration of this. Now, when Abraham was in his tent, he was in his, in his, his hometown, his community, right? And God said, Abraham, get up and go. And he didn't even say where. He just said, get up and go to a place where I will show you, right? What did Abraham do? He got up and went. Did you know God kind of asked him, I mean, that's kind of a big commitment. If God says, I want you to pack up and leave town to a place I'll show you, some of us might not even do that. Abraham did that, but in the big ball of wax, the big scheme of things, that really wasn't a, a big, you know, a big pressing, urgent. It wasn't a big deal. Now, if God, the very first time he ever contacted Abraham, said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Do you think Abraham had done it? Our faith grows er, from faith to faith. See, when God called Abraham out of his hometown in Canaan, he left. He got up, he left. And then there was a famine. God permitted a famine to happen to test Abraham's faith. Unfortunately, Abraham failed that test, and he went down to Egypt. He shouldn't have gone that way. God told him not to go that way, but he went down to Egypt. But each step of the way, as he traveled, God would throw something in his path. Circumstances, a test, a trial. And as Abraham overcome them, his faith grew. Now after this had went on for several dozen years, after he was promised a son and didn't get it for a decade, 
and he's 100 years old, and finally he gets the son that God promised him. Then a day came when, Abraham, I want you to take your son up and sacrifice him to me. Now Abraham's faith had grew. He had grown from faith to faith. He had passed many trials. He had overcome a lot of temptations. His faith grew. And when the point came where God said, Abraham, I want you to kill your beloved son, the son I promised you, he was willing to do it. In fact, he had the knife in his hand ready to plunge it down on his son Isaac when an angel stayed his hand. His faith grew. Faith is like a muscle. We looked at that in Sunday school, I said that, because Levi was saying something very similar. It's like a muscle. It gets stronger the more you use it. Abraham had problems with his worldly nephew, a young fellow named Lot. He had a lot of problems with Lot. He also had problems with his wife. Remember Abraham's wife, Sarah? Sarai, who became Sarah? Or was it the other way around? Now I'd have to look. He, yeah, he, he had a lot of problems with Hagar. Remember Hagar? See, that, that son that God promised, he didn't get it, and he didn't get it, and he didn't get it, and she's 90 and he's 100 before they got it, but just before that happened, they had this brilliant idea. Let's help God. Here, take my maid and, and get the promised son through my maid. That's how they had Ishmael. Do you know that's the father of the, the Arab nation? The, the father of the nation of Islam? That's where they bring their descendants down through. They, they view the promise from Abraham going through Hagar. The Jews view it coming through Sarah and through Isaac and Jacob, right? They've been at war ever since, ever since the time of Abraham. The sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac have been at war with each other. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. If you can't test your faith, you can't trust it. God tries your faith. He tests your faith. Not to destroy it, but to develop it, to make you stronger. Had Abraham not learned to trust in God, he would have never had the faith to, to, to willingly sacrifice his son. Paul prayed that the suffering of the Christians in Thessalonica might grow them in their faith. I think putting your faith, putting your life on the line for your faith is a sure way to grow it, is it not? I don't think we have that problem here in America. Our lives are not on the line for our faith. Not yet, anyways. The way I see our society moving, we're moving that direction, but we're not like to get there tomorrow or this week. But how strong is your faith? Have you been exercising your faith? Do you have your faith on a good diet? And I don't mean food, I mean the Word of God. I mean prayer. This is ways to grow your faith. And then when you're tested, when you're tempted, when you're tried, when these things happen to you that you don't want to happen, view them like opportunities. These are what bring you to your next level. These are what grows you. This is what was growing them. Oh, if you could have a time machine to go back and to, to visit that church in Thessalonica and to see the believers. I wish I could see it in their eyes. They were willing to put their lives on the line for their faith in Jesus. Has the church moved very far from that in our strength of our faith? The church today? In conclusion, Paul was concerned for the faith of the believers in Thessalonica. He sent them Timothy to help them in their faith. He sends them a letter which becomes the inspired word of God. So he sends them the word and he prays for them fervently, often, frequently, daily, he said. Now, I'm here as your helper, as your pastor. I'm not Timothy. I don't have any apostolic power, nothing special, other than I love you guys and I love God. And that's all we need. I have the, a complete record right here, a full disclosure from God in my New Testament and the Old Testament too. I have His very Word, which is there's nothing better. I know the answers. I know the difference between right and wrong. I want to help you get into the Word to understand it, and probably more than that, to apply it to your life so you can be doers of the Word. I want you to take that Word and pass it on to others. This is what they were doing in Thessalonica. You know they were dying for their faith. Well, they didn't all die, right? Because they were passing the Word on. 
One person. Just, it only took one person to share their faith with someone else. And then they were two. And if those two people shared their faith with someone else, then there'd be four. And eight, and 16, and 32, and 64. And how far up can your brain go without writing it down? It's exponential. I want you to do that. I want you to know that I am praying for you as a church. I'm praying for you daily as a church. I expect you to be praying for me. Because when we're going down the path that's right, when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we have an enemy. His name's Satan, and he's real. He's not, a mayor, he's not a fairy tale. He's not a mythical figure. He's just as real as Jesus Christ is. And he don't want us honoring God. He don't want us glorifying God. He don't want us sharing the Word. He don't want us sharing the good news, particularly that, because he don't want others to find Christ and get forgiveness of their sins. He's real, and he's really an enemy. And I need your prayers so that we can be real and share the gospel and to grow, and to mature, and to have our faith tested, and tried, and become more. You know, every Wednesday we kind of do this. I wish more of you would come out and do it with us. We look at the Word. We pray for each other. That's what we do on Wednesdays. Amen? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You for the Word. I thank You for Your Holy Word that lets me know right from wrong. Your holy word that saved my soul. I thank you for the writings of Paul and, 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 and the other apostles that I might know. I might know where I stand. Whether I be on shaky, loose sand or if I'm standing on the rock of my Savior. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you sent Timothy to that church and that that church prevailed, that they held fast to their faith even though they were martyred for it. I can't wait to see some of them believers when I get up there. Lord, I thank you for the, the, the prayer. Just the, it almost the words escape me, Lord. Just the ability to be able to talk to you, the creator of my soul, the creator of all that there is. Just to be able to talk to you and, and to read your word and to know that you desire this, that you, that you crave us talking to you. I thank you for that. It's a privilege, Lord. I thank you for answered prayer. Even when the answer is no, I thank you for your answers, Lord. I thank you for this body of believers here. Lord, and I pray that we would want to be neck deep in your word and in prayer and realize that they have to go together to be on a solid foundation for you. Lord, I pray that you would show us your path, that you would, you would guide and direct us as a church for your righteousness, for your purpose for this community. I pray for your protection on us all. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.